cadmium, lead, mercury, dioxin, PCBs. These are some of the ingredients that make up the toxic stew that simmered at the bottom of the lower Hackensack River for decades. Every time the river floods, and it does quite often, there's a risk that these toxins will spread. Climate change is expected to make flooding here more intense and more frequent. But there is some cause for celebration. The Lower Hackensack River may soon be named New Jersey's 115th Superfund site. This is Hazard a limited series about the impacts of climate change on Superfund sites here in New Jersey. I'm Jordan Gospore, an investigative journalist from Texas. My family likes to go fishing. My first boyfriend loved to fly fish. To this day, I don't understand how anyone could find fishing fun. But I do enjoy listening to the folklore. Have you heard the one about the diver who saw a catfish the size of a pickup truck? Or the one about the two-headed trout? What about the tale of the blue claw crabs that have high levels of cancer-causing toxins built up in their tissue? The scary thing about that story is that it's true. A century of pollution led the state of New Jersey to ban fishing and eating blue claw crabs from the lower Hackensack River. I'm imagining these large mutant crabs scaring swimmers and jumping out of the water onto boats. But most of the time, they look just like normal crabs. Except for all that mercury inside them that can cause damage to the nervous system. I went to Laurel Hill County Park in Secaucus to take a tour of the famed Hackensack River. There were signs in different languages warning park goers about the ban. Blue claw crabs in Lower Passaic River and Newark Bay Complex may cause cancer. I can understand why people would still want to fish in the river, despite the toxic crabs that are just begging to have a horror movie made about them. The water had this strange beauty, and I kept getting Henry David Thoreau vibes. Though me becoming one with nature was short-lived because of the beep beeping noises from the nearby construction of a luxury apartment building. It was a similar way of thinking about development and progress that laid waste to the Hackensack River to begin with. The EPA found that a 19-mile stretch of the lower Hackensacks riverbed is filled with contaminants. Walter Mugden with the EPA says these toxins can wash ashore when it floods and spread all over the place. So the biggest concern in that case is that major storms can mobilize the mud. They can re-entrain the mud into the water. If you have flooding, that sediment, uh, that mud that's in the, entrained in the water can get onto the land, it can get into people's homes, uh, into buildings. And uh, it can also move stuff around, so it gets from an area that has more contamination, it might move into areas that were less contaminated and actually make them worse. This spring, after years of study, the EPA formally nominated the Hackensack to the Superfund list. If the process goes as planned, the river will become New Jersey's 115th Superfund site in the fall. Being designated a Superfund site means the EPA can begin the years-long process of cleaning up the river. And although there's no guarantee the river will ever be clean enough to eat the blue claw crab, for Captain Bill Sheehan with the Hackensack Riverkeeper, it's worth a try. One of the most natural things that humans can do is catch a fish and eat it. And yet we're told it's not safe to do that. And if we let this river try to clean itself, And, you know, shunting aside climate change and future impacts and everything else, if the river's just left to be itself, it could take 150 to 200 years to get to the point where it would be safe to eat a crab or eat a fish. And that means several generations of people living here will not have full beneficial use of the river. By putting it on the Superfund list, Even if it takes 20 or 25 years to get it cleaned up, that's one generation's lifetime. Bill has been pushing for the Hackensack River to be designated a Superfund site for years. He was born and raised along the river, 
and is the son of a barge captain. I was always told growing up, to stay away from the river. It was a mess, and you know, there's raw sewage and dead animals and all kinds of stuff going on. And uh, as I grew older, I got into fishing. When I met him at the park, he definitely looked the part of a captain. What stood out the most to me was the shark tooth necklace. It reminded me of my favorite character from the movie Jaws, Quint. He's the one that gets eaten by the shark on the boat. Anywho, uh, Bill started the Hackensack Riverkeeper in 1997 to protect the river from polluters. I was just getting an attitude about, you know, the fact that everywhere you look, they were destroying habitat. And I was like, don't complain to me about not being able to catch fish if you're giving people permits to fill in wetlands and to destroy fish habitat. And so I had an epiphany one day and said, nobody else is doing it, I might as well try. In April, I got to go on a tour of the urban wilderness with Bill on a state government boat. We were joined by New Jersey DEP Commissioner Sean LaTourette, Walter Mugden, who's the Deputy Regional Administrator for EPA Region 2, and State Senator Teresa Ruiz. Commissioner LaTourette says it's not a bad thing for New Jersey to add another Superfund site. You'll have many states throughout the country that are reluctant to have an NPL listing because they see Superfund as a, I don't know, a stain on the state's reputation um, or as an inconvenience or something that might detract from the ability to drive economic growth. Um, We see it just the opposite. During our trip, the noises of the highway, trains, and airplanes competed with the sounds of birds. It was a reminder of the river's past and a peek into the future of what could be if this area is cleaned up. I'm going to take you back now to 2015. This was the year the lower Hackensack almost made the Superfund list. Walter Mugden with the EPA says the agency studied the river to see if it met the program's criteria. We found very much what you'd expect. We found a lot of mercury. We found arsenic. We found lead. We found PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls. We found PAHs, which are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So we found a whole soup of chemicals. But New Jersey's then governor, Republican Chris Christie, never endorsed the river to be put on the list, even though the EPA urged him to do so. In 2017, the EPA's report on the river found widespread contamination. But even that wasn't enough for the Christie administration to seek Superfund status for the river. I, Philip Dunton Murphy, elected governor of the state of New Jersey. The tides shifted just a few months later, when Democrat Phil Murphy became New Jersey's governor at the start of 2018. Now, officials in Trenton, with a different way of thinking, are all in on using the Superfund to finally clean up the lower Hackensack. Having learned a lot from Superfund sites, including uh, the Passaic River nearby, I think we've got a great set of tools, an incredible set of partners in EPA uh, to move this uh, a hell of a lot faster. So that's our goal. No one knows how much it'll cost to clean up the site, but polluted waterways are some of the most expensive to clean. To give you some idea, and in case you haven't listened to the Diamond Alkali episode of Hazard NJ, the Passaic River cleanup is expected to cost more than a billion dollars. The Hackensack River winds through the heart of the New Jersey Meadowlands, that vast marshland long known as a dumping ground for trash, and some believe the bodies of mobsters. According to urban legend, Jimmy Hoffa, the infamous Teamster boss, is buried under the old giant stadium, now dubbed MetLife Stadium. Judith Weiss is a Rutgers Newark professor who spent decades studying the biological effects of contamination in the Meadowlands. I think the wetlands is special because it's particularly urban wetland with a bunch of problems and it has been abused for many, many years. I mean, all the garbage from New York City and the waste from demolishing Penn Station. So it was a real mess. Back in the day, people thought the wetlands were, well, 
more like a wasteland than a place of tranquility. It was land they thought couldn't be used for anything other than a dump. Oh, and they dumped. There was a reason this area was considered the armpit of the Northeast. In 1970, there were 51 different landfills operating in the Meadowlands. But it's more than just a trash problem. The Meadowlands is dotted with some of the worst toxic sites in the country. And much of the pollution in the Meadowlands comes from five nearby Superfund sites. You got Berries Creek, a six-mile tributary of the Hackensack River that has had some of the highest mercury readings in the world. Much of the toxins there came from the Ventron Velsicle operation in Karlstadt and Woodridge. The company processed mercury from 1929 until 1974. Then there's Universal Oil Products in East Rutherford, where various chemicals were produced from 1930 to 1979. Also, scientific chemical processing in Karlstadt, where harsh chemicals were used as part of dealing with scrap and waste. And Diamond Head Oil Refinery, AKA Oil Lake in Kearney. That one kind of speaks for itself. Things started to change, slowly, for the Meadowlands in the 50s, when the New Jersey Turnpike brought new interest to the area. State leaders now saw economic potential in the trash-filled marshes. The Hackensack Meadowlands Development Commission was formed in 1968, and the 70s brought a crackdown on illegal dumping. As the dumps closed one by one, new development sprung up around them. A stadium for the New York Giants and New York Jets, a horse racing track, an arena for the New Jersey Nets, and most recently, American Dream, the nation's second largest mall. Today, all but one landfill in the Meadowlands has been closed. Most of the former dumps have been capped to keep the garbage juice from leaking out. Judith says the Federal Clean Water Act, passed in 1972, was a critical step in curbing pollution in the Meadowlands. The raw sewage wasn't going in there anymore. So the water quality got better. I mean, there's things that we'd never seen there before. So it, it's, I think, a very hopeful place in that you see this huge improvement over something that nobody would have ever wanted to visit. 50 years ago, you know, when you stop abusing it and you stop doing all that bad stuff to it, it comes back. Even without a Superfund distinction, the Meadowlands have become one of the state's most successful environmental comeback stories. Many people wrote off the Meadowlands as a place that was left for dead. But the cleanup efforts have already brought the area back to life animals have returned. And what may be the biggest surprise is that people are actually choosing to visit the Meadowlands to birdwatch or kayak or do other outdoorsy things that my allergies prevent me from doing. Ecotourism is great. I'm glad there are people who can be out on the water without getting motion sickness. But restoring and preserving the Meadowlands plays an even bigger role in the state's economy. The area is preparing the state for rising sea levels. During Superstorm Sandy in 2012, communities in the Meadowlands were devastated by a wall of water that rose up from Newark Bay and rushed up the Hackensack River. There's not much that could have totally protected people from the eight-foot-tall storm surge, but it's likely the Meadowlands blunted the blow. Think of wetlands as nature's sponge. They help soak up water and sediment from rain and storm events. Because of Sandy, the federal government gave the Meadowlands a multi-million dollar grant to figure out ways to reduce the risk of floods and improve stormwater drainage. It's a project called Rebuild by Design. And after years of development, officials decided to move ahead with a project that relies in part on restoring wetlands. Development has significantly reduced the size of the Meadowlands marshes. And as sea levels continue to rise, the remaining marshes aren't always able to keep up. Judith says parts of the Meadowlands are being drowned away. That means the area is losing its ability to absorb surge water from extreme weather events. There's still more development going on and losing marshes 
And, you know, the marshes are so valuable and they've lost so many already over the past centuries. You can't make up for it by making a new marsh somewhere else. So we have greatly reduced the amount of marsh. And if you've built something on a marsh, it should be no surprise that it's going to flood easily. Captain Bills noticed the rise in sea level in the Meadowlands. The water line that used to go up to the docks at Laurel Hill Park, where I started my river journey, is now at the edge of the parking lot where the Hackensack River Keepers kayaks are stored. The town of Little Ferry knows the Hackensack River's beauty and its potential for harm. Mauro Ragusio was the mayor of Little Ferry in 2012. That spring, he and his wife had moved into their new home. By the fall, it was destroyed. It was something you never forget when you can finally get to your house for the first time. And you look and everything that you own is at the curb. Little Ferry was smacked by Superstorm Sandy. More than 80% of the town was underwater and residents were displaced for months after the storm. Joanne Libretto has lived in Little Ferry for most of her life. The night Superstorm Sandy hit the town, Joanne was staying with her sister, who lived across the street. So the night before the storm, I said to her, you know, Tere, I have a bad feeling about this storm. I think I'll sleep by you tonight. She said, yeah, come on, we'll have a pajama party. Around 10 o'clock, Joanne says her sister's nephew called and told them, the water's coming. And before we knew it, the street was filled. The house was just filling up with water. The next day, Joanne says she walked across the street to her home to inspect the damage. She couldn't believe her eyes. The water was five feet high. The refrigerator was floating. The dining room chairs were floating. In the back room, there was water all over, everywhere you could look, everywhere you could imagine there was water. The water was muddy and coated Joanne's belongings. It was a very, very, very hard time for me. Very hard. I lost everything. I lost my children's wedding videos, my late husband's pictures, my grandchildren's pictures, my washer, my dryer, my refrigerator, everything you could imagine. We lost everything. Everything was out on the curb. And when you walked down the block and you witnessed all this, you thought to yourself, what happened? What? Was it a bomb? What happened? It was horrendous. It was horrendous. There's no words. There's no words. Joanne says every time there's a storm, she cringes. I think over the years, the fear that it could happen again is really bad for us. That's how I feel right now. And I, don't, I, I guess I, I thought time would heal, but it doesn't, because you never know. You just don't know. And now they're predicting all these hurricanes. I mean, 14 hurricanes. Are we going to be lucky enough to not have an issue? Mayor Ragusio agrees that another Sandy could happen in Little Ferry, and other parts of the country. So we need to do better as a state and as a nation to prepare for the effects of of climate change because it's real, it's here, and it will happen again. Morrow is still the mayor of Little Ferry and has watched the town bounce back. We are better off than we were 10 years ago, but certainly if another Sandy comes, it'll be the same effect because you cannot stop those sort of surge events. You can't. He believes cleaning up the Hackensack River will help protect the area from future storms and the spread of any existing toxins. But there has to be more to it than that. I think that uh, the wetlands that exist need to be restored. I think they have a purpose and a function, and I think they're necessary. But I also think that we have to look at all the options, not just wetlands restoration. But I'm completely for it. Now, all these homes and all these businesses in the entire region, they're not just going to disappear. So that's why we need to restore what's left, and we need to think of engineering opportunities to protect the area as well from surge events. 
Hazard is a space not just for learning about Superfund sites, but for engaging our communities in conversation around the cleanup of these toxic places. Do you have questions about Superfund sites in New Jersey? Do you live near one? If so, I want to hear from you. Send me a tweet using hashtag HazardNJ or leave me a voice memo at hazard at myNJPBS.org. We may play your comments in a future episode. Hazard NJ is an NJ Spotlight News production. The show is written, edited, and hosted by me, Jordan Gospore. Jamie Kraft is the executive producer with NJ Spotlight News. Our executive in charge of production is Joe Lee. Michael Saul Warren is our associate producer. Chris Panza is our production assistant. Chloe Matisi is our production manager. Additional research by Meryl Moshum. Our sound designer and engineer is Mark Bush. Music for Hazard and Jay was composed by Nick Pennington. Artwork by Matthew Fleming. Support for Hazard and Jay is provided by Peril and Promise, a public media reporting initiative covering the human stories of climate change and its solutions, with major funding provided by Dr. P. Roy Vagelos and Diana T. Vagelos. You can learn more at pbs.org forward slash Peril and Promise.